Enrichment clusters are another major part of the school-wide enrichment model and we, we bring to bear upon enrichment clusters students' interests, their ability to have their curriculum compacted, and of course enrichment clusters are certainly based on the enrichment triad model as well. So Joe's work is translated into, as we've said earlier, schools, magnet schools, enrichment programs, gifted programs, and probably, as we say, the growth stock of school-wide enrichment has been enrichment clusters. Most enrichment clusters focus on type ones and type twos. So in enrichment clusters, students get exposed to new ideas, they have group training activities, and in some enrichment clusters, students actually move in and start a type three. Um, if enrichment clusters run for 12 or 13 weeks, they might get a very good start, but if they're only running for five or six weeks, they're generally going to be mainly type one and type two and some introductory products and services. So again, they're, they're, they can be all three parts of the enrichment triad model, but generally you find them to be more of type one, type two, and what some people have called type two and a half, small projects, small products that can be done in a period of six to 10 weeks. But the nice thing about enrichment clusters is that oftentimes for teachers, it helps teachers develop flexibility. So you might ask why enrichment clusters? And a lot of it is not only for students, but it's also for teachers. We want teachers to develop some flexibility in their teaching style, to have a chance to develop their own creativity, and also to have some fun. So um, this Confucius quote is a big part of why we talk about enrichment clusters. Choose a job you'll love and you'll never have to work a day in your life. Enrichment clusters should be about doing something that you love, that you enjoy, something you look forward to doing with a group of students who also has a common interest in that topic or issue or area of concentration. I love this quote from the middle school enrichment cluster. Uh, research project that I did with our colleague, Marcia Gentry. Suddenly I remember why I'd gone into teaching in the first place. I'd forgotten and I didn't even know I'd forgotten. Then I remembered what I always thought teaching would be about. So enrichment clusters give students a chance to come back and do the things that we, we want them to do. So if in your school you no longer have time for drama or plays or or creative magazines or enrichment opportunities, this is the time. I think it's important to realize that all teachers have interests. So if we ask teachers what kinds of things they've done, what kinds of things they like to do, were they ever involved in sports, were they ever involved in arts, were they ever involved in writing, were they ever involved in social action or social service, these are oftentimes the, the responses we get. Well, I was in robotics, or I was involved in a writing club, or I'm a gardener, or I do this in my spare time. And so we want enrichment clusters to be an opportunity for teachers to have some fun as well as students as well, and to bring a healthy dose of enrichment to the school. Now, uh, a few things not to do when you're implementing clusters, and then we'll talk about what you do and how they're actually implemented. So we don't want to have students uh, develop, we don't want you to have, have to develop units or lesson plans because enrichment clusters are supposed to be based on the interests of students. So we don't want unit or lesson plans. We don't want you to have predetermined expectations about projects. We don't want you to do all the talking. We don't want everybody doing the same thing. And we don't want a kind of traditional, orderly, quiet classroom. We want students to be working in corners. We want students to be working together on things they have an interest in. We want them to be broken down by areas of learning styles or product styles or the, the contents within the cluster <clears throat> that they'd like to work on. So again, these are what we don't want. Let's talk about what we want. The major features of enrichment clusters is the idea that every student is special if we create conditions that make student a specialist and a specialized group. And that's the idea, that they specialize in something in which they have an interest. So children select their top choice of clusters from a brochure or at an assembly. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a little while, the how-to, but let's talk about what are the major features. First is that 
all activities directed toward the production of some kind of product or service. So we're leaning towards the production of some kind of product or service in an enrichment cluster. Secondly, students and teachers all select the, the cluster, top, usually top three choices, in which they will participate, and every teacher and student are involved. Even if teachers end up being aides to, in clusters that are very large, everybody's doing something. We have schools where the, the principal is offered a cluster, the school psychologist is offered a cluster, the administrative assistant to the principal, the school secretary, the school janitor. We oftentimes see clusters where parents that are coming in, that, that teachers are working with parents. So we want a lot of involvement, community involvement, parental involvement, but particularly school involvement. In clusters, we want students grouped across grade levels by their interest areas, so usually two to three grade levels. So students in grades one to three, or K to two, or four to six, usually that's, that's the, a good range, but not just by grade, so usually grouped across grade levels. Number four is, again, no predetermined lesson plans. This is not an enormous prep for you as a teacher because you're doing this in an area of interest. Your first couple of weeks are talking about the area, maybe bringing in a speaker, but more on that in a few minutes. The, the fifth area that's a key part of enrichment clusters is that we're using authentic methods like we do in type three, authentic meth methods to pursue products and services. And so we want students to know what real writers do, what poets do, what robotics engineers do, and we're, we're imitating those at a slightly junior level, but nevertheless, authentic methods. We are using division of labor, so all students are not doing the same thing. So let's say you have a cluster on developing a creative writing magazine. Not everybody's going to be doing writing. Some students will be doing production. Some students will be doing art. Not everyone's going to be doing the same thing at the same time. Seven, when we do clusters, we do them during specially designated time blocks. So we set aside time blocks, and this might be Friday afternoons. It might be Wednesday afternoons. We like to see clusters for an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half. The very least, you need a little over an hour because students have to move to different rooms. And we want to set aside these time blocks in advance so we're not interfering with specialists. We don't want students to have to miss phys ed. We don't want to have to miss art. So it's a great tip if you're going to do clusters to plan for that the year before and have that block of time that's specialist free so students aren't missing any, any special times with their um, phys ed or art or music teachers. And also, of course, we want to make sure if the golden rule is what I said it is, the silver rule is that we're suspending the rules of regular school. We're cross-grading. Students are being based, uh, are in clusters based on their interests. We have products and services. And these are the, the key rules for enrichment clusters. So there's questions that you can start a cluster with. And these are the normal questions that facilitators of a cluster start with. What do people who are interested in this area do? So, what do people that, that, create, um, that create robotics companies do? What do people that, that build uh, a company based on, um, let's say it happens to be landscaping or gardening do? What do people who are uh, in this particular area, kinds of products they create? So, what do poets create? What services do they provide? They do songwriting, they do cards, they don't just write books of poetry. Uh, the third is what methods do they use to carry out their work? So how do professional creative writers operate? How do quilters operate? How do professional gardeners or landscapers are, operate? And these are questions that we want to introduce. What resources and materials do they need to produce a high quality service or product? How and when do they communicate the results of their work? And then, of course, what steps to, do they need to take to have some kind of an impact upon an audience? And these are the six key questions um, that we ask when we develop an enrichment cluster. And again, we're very excited about this because this is very, very different than the regular curriculum. So normally what we want to do when we're creating a cluster program is think about making sure we have clusters in all of the major disciplinary areas. So all the major content areas, all of the things that we know students would have an interest in. We want clusters in fine arts. We want them in science. We want them in social studies. We want them in music. We want 
them in math. And then we want to make sure there are some clusters that are focused and designed for our more advanced students. So if you have students doing invention convention, for example, developing an invention, this may be a time to give them additional work, time to work on their invention. Even if you have students who are talented in the arts, you could have a cluster that attracts students who are talented in the arts. So we want some clusters that are going to be targeted for our more academically advanced students. And this is, of course, where compacting comes in. All teachers know the kinds of students and the students in their classes that have advanced achievement or ability levels, and there should be some clusters for those students. Um, these are some families of enrichment clusters that are offered. So we often see, cl see clusters in language arts, literature, the humanities, like the Poets Workshop, the African American Literary Society, the Quarterly Review of Children's Literature, a group of students that review the new books coming into the library and read their reviews in the morning uh, over the PA or put them in the school newspaper. Or having a, a school newspaper can be a wonderful enrichment cluster. There's clusters in physical and life sciences, Save the Dolphins, the Mansfield Environmental Protection Agency. There are clusters in the arts, the Electronic Music Institute, Native American Dance, Young Musicians Ensemble, Photography, Video Production. So again, I think you'll see we want clusters in all different areas. Social Sciences, the Junior Historical Society, the Creative Cartographers Guild. Um, many, many schools have been so creative in their implementation of clusters. One school, for example, called every single cluster a guild. And that was extremely exciting and interesting. And all the students produced great products and great services. Um, mathematics, the female mathematician support group that got together to help young girls that said they couldn't do math well or were struggling when they really, a lot of these young, young women realized that really it was a confidence issue. The Math Competition League, the Math Mentors Association. So what we're looking for are are every content area being introduced in clusters. Computers, the computer, Creative Computer Software Society, the Computer Games Production Company, Physical Education, Experimental Games, Physical Fitness Support Group, Industrial Arts and Home Economics, um, Experimental Dietary Groups, Child Care Assistance Groups, so many opportunities for people to think about what they love and the kinds of things they would like to do with a group of students who also loves it and also wants to do it. I just mentioned that there are a couple of articles on our website that we will link to our, our SEM toolkit, and including uh, one that tells the story of uh, uh, Richmond Clusters at Bret Hart Middle School in South Dakota that actually operated for a couple of years. It's a fascinating beginning to this enrichment cluster. We'll hope you take a look at this article that will be linked to this video. Now, part of clusters that is critically important is how-to books, how to make your science project more scientific, um, how to do better research, how to collect data. Uh, it might be how-to books in the literature area or in engineering, the animator's workbook starting the, the elements of great, doing great pop-up books or pop-up cards, plays for young pumpeteers or engineers. This is a part of the school-wide enrichment model that will bring so much joy to your students and spread so much happiness across the school. Students can't wait when they get out of school to tell their parents about their enrichment cluster. Um, you can have how-to books used in clusters on debate and social action and business. Again, in every area, look at these three just in cartooning. Um, clusters and cartoons always sell out. Students always want to take this. Clusters in establishing a museum. We've seen many, many, many places that actually end up building museums in their schools or museums in their small communities. Clusters in storytelling, getting published, playwriting, poetry. Clusters in archaeology and history and how to do history. So we hope you get the point that having an enrichment cluster, you're going to need some great type ones to get kids excited. You're going to need some tight type twos in terms of how-to books in a wide variety of areas. And then you're going to need some imaginations to help students. Um, a very popular cluster has always been crime scene investigations, um, art history, uh, anything to do with hands-on stuff that students just absolutely love. And of course, 
clusters are a great place to teach students how, how to gather data and how to come together when they gather data and work as a group in tape recording and video recording and dissecting and, and, and doing things where they learn about real data and what real practicing professionals do. Now the next slide tells you all of the various short-term products that come out, can come out of a cluster. Of course, you're not gonna build a new museum in six weeks, but you could get a pretty good start in 12 weeks. Some students start a cluster in the fall and continue it in the spring. Some students start a cluster with a lot of type ones and type twos and some beginnings of type three and then finish a type three on their own or under the guidance of their classroom teacher or an enrichment specialist. So again, you'll see many, many examples of student products that you could consider as part of your cluster. Please feel free to refer back to this. And then you'll see some students that did start small museums in their school. Uh, and, and again, this is the excitement about doing a cluster. It's for a, a product and a service, not necessarily just for your classroom, but the school, the community. Many people do clusters based on local problems. One of my favorite clusters was a group of students. The cluster was named Helping Hands, Giving Hearts. And they went into senior citizens, convalescent homes, and just said, what kinds of things can we do to cheer up the people in this convalescent home? So many students want to do service projects in their communities or around their schools to make their schools a better place. So many different examples. We've seen clusters on quilting that actually teach a good bit about uh, American history. There are so many how-to books about quilting. There's a National Quilting Museum in Paducah, Kentucky that has fabulous resources online. So you can make any interest area a little bit more academic. Um, we like to see clusters that have a focus on academics or the arts. Um, and we want these clusters, though, whenever possible, also to, to bring some challenge, some of what we hope for in type two into the cluster as well. More advanced problem solving, more advanced research skills, more opportunities for students to be able to come up with advanced projects. And again, even in, even in quilting, we'll find how you make history, how women's history was told through quilting. So the next series of slides are just some examples about how, how clusters are advertised. Most schools that implement clusters, elementary, middle, high school, send home a brochure. Some uh, and the brochures, the students are asked to mark their top three choices. Some schools do it with a PowerPoint presentation and the PowerPoint presentation is held in the gymnasium or the cafeteria or it's held in a, a small auditorium and teachers actually introduce their cluster like this with a PowerPoint. Um, some of these are, are posted online and students go home and discuss them with their teachers. Most clusters are held on either, as I said, Friday afternoon is a very popular time. Wednesday afternoon is a very popular time. Most last for between six to 12 weeks. And remember, all students are eligible and should participate in enrichment clusters. In our research, we found that students that have behavioral problems Oftentimes, those particular students didn't have behavior problems when they were able to pursue and get into a cluster in their area of interest. All students should have an opportunity to participate in clusters. Um, I've been in schools where there's eight, there are 800 students, and within four minutes, students are in their cluster as soon as the cluster starts. So if they start at 1.30 and go until 3.00, uh, the bell rings at 1.30. By 1.35, everybody's in their cluster. It's a joyful time, and we hope you'll be interested in starting a program like this in your school. There's a book. Obviously, there's a chapter about enrichment clusters in the SEM book, but there's also a book on enrichment clusters that give you the how-to, published by Joe Renzulli, Marcia Gentry, and myself with a lot of helpful information. The research on clusters show that it's a great way to help teachers differentiate instruction because when they begin to differentiate within a cluster, they bring 
some of those differentiation skills back to their classrooms. It's also a wonderful way to know students other than the students in your classroom and to have those students knew, know you too. Students build relationships with teachers other than their classroom teachers and clusters. Students are happy, parents are happy, teachers are happy. This is a joyful amount of learning that goes on with lots and lots of advanced content. So we hope you'll be interested in doing enrichment clusters. It's a fabulous way to start an SEM program. Thank you so much.